I was born here in, uh, as I mentioned earlier, on West Clinton Street, which is one of the still main streets in Huntsville. But at that time, um, <clears throat> in Huntsville, you had to select certain neighborhoods to live in. And we had to move, even though we owned the house. And the whole community was eliminated, basically, because there was a need to have a uh, parkway, which you probably came down on. And our house is right off of Clinton, sitting on that corner. And, and it's a house that I never forget. And when I think about living in Huntsville, I don't think about this house. I think about that house. So it was, it was demoralizing to have to move. And the gentleman said he was going to buy our house and the one next to it. That was Woody Anderson, his late Woody Anderson, who was the owner of Ford Motor Company still. His wife, family still owns that. And uh, it was traumatic, and just to put it briefly, but we built, moved over here and built this house from the monies from that house. It was paid for when it was built. But um, you see it's deteriorated now to, what, to the degree that it has deteriorated the houses around, raggedy, drug infested. I've been fighting a war with that just to exist and to eliminate that, a daily war. And I'm probably only a vocal homeowner on this street. If there are any, they don't show. <laughs> so living in Huntsville has been uh, good and it has been bad. I've, liked, I've enjoyed seeing the growth. I've enjoyed seeing the change. And I always enjoy change because that's an improvement. And I can imagine when th these, when the city was beginning, you know, during the Von Braun era, uh, I can imagine as I read and study about uh, Milton Cummings, I mentioned him over, he was a center person, key person in Huntsville, who was a businessman. He was in agriculture. He was, he was the one that has this uh, uh, large building over on Meridian Street, it still exists, so he's passed long ago, but I'm saying they're remnants of his role. And he was a leader in this transition. And he mobilized the community in different ways because he was moneyed and he was educated, I assumed, and he was ready for change because cotton was no longer serving him well. And he had to move on as any businessman looks for the next day. And I think he was a leader in that. And he mobilized the, the uh, mayors, because he probably was there doing two different mayors, two or three. But mayors, historically, in this process have been mobilized to think right and think forward and think about change and the benefits to this community and to themselves and to the city. People uh, respected Huntsville because of the number of educated people that, they, that existed, leadership, and goals and things that they were trying to do, education. We had two colleges here, University of Alabama came on afterwards in the 60s, I guess, 60s. A&M came in the 18, mid-1800s. So you had uh, two universities and then Oakwood College, a university now. But uh, that was a great force in a town whose population at that time was probably about 70,000. And so uh, it served well some of the needs. And then you have cultural activities we have, the, and we've extended it recently where people come for plays and art, artist, artistic expressions and uh, opera, operas, and which I enjoy listening to. It's just a cross-section of classes, well-off people who can foster the cultural activities. And that's still a mainstay, so I'm saying it's a mainstay now. It has been historically. And it will likely be continued because of the nature of the people who were here. And so do you, and again, I understand that mm -hmm. you don't know a whole lot about this, but just as, as someone mm -hmm. who's spent most of your life in the Huntsville, yeah. um, do you get a sense that the, the transplanted Germans who came <coughs> had, had on Huntsville, culturally speaking? Well, I never had any personal exchange with them because I was a classroom teacher, professor at, at later a uh, time, and uh, 
my business and involved in the research part of this time. And I was involved in my career development, and it didn't include too much exchange with people in those uh, areas. Because still, Huntsville was very much segregated. But in terms of things like appreciation of the arts, performing yeah, arts, yeah, you know, yeah. do you, do you in, in, in sort of thinking about Huntsville sort of pre-World War II <coughs> and Huntsville post-World War II, do you see any major shift? Oh, yeah. The ch major shift began with the development of the missile economy. And that was in the in the 60s, 50s, 60s. Really started before then, because Huntsville Redstone was a, a arsenal for weapons, and of course that's just on the lower end of the intellectual activity of the missile program. But it kind of modified and sold that and moved on to the missile area era. So uh, the the change has evolved consistently since that time with people who we have to look at. If you look at the data, I don't have the exact data, but you have one of the largest population of people per capita, of people with doctorates, of people with uh, uh, engineers, and other areas. So it, it's top heavy with this type of intellectual activity. And that's just going to bring change constantly and development and positive things. And I'm sure uh, von Braun, as you mentioned, was a factor for this. He was a major factor. He was, a, I think, critical. And he probably, as I can envision him, being quiet, making decisions, and contacting the right people, and being in control co covertly. So, well, let, let's back up again. I've kind of gotten us yeah. a little bit ahead of ourselves. Mm -hmm. but, so. Okay, so you were born in Huntsville. Talk to me about growing up in Huntsville. What was Huntsville like? <coughs> well, um, I, uh, I was a happy little girl because I could go to school every day. And the school I went to was my school, Council High. And uh, it was across the railroad track and slummed areas all around, and I've stressed that in my thesis. And it was not a place that you wanted to really uh, be happy about, but I was happy because of the learning process. And uh, I, it, you asking me, what did I experience? I experienced segregation every day, racism every day. But I don't think it bothered me that much, but it did bother me. Uh, and one a little article in my thesis said that um, but to describe the conditions in which the school was located, it, was, it said, this publication was, that it just shouldn't have even been there, and it shouldn't have been. But it was a place that uh, served our purposes. And as a young person, I would go to Sunday school and church, and, and we'd have little get-togethers and things going on in the community, but it was a totally separate society when I grew up, because I was born in 1933. So you can see this is now 19, 2011. I've seen a lot. Huntsville, once again, was a culturally based city. And it was one that had goals and purposes and aspirations to be a bigger, better city, I think, from day one. Uh, the process between the growth up to 55 and see I graduated from college in 1954 so at that time well I went to school at A&M I stayed on campus the whole four years though I was nearby but by choice I wanted to do that I worked the whole four years and I finished within the four years which many students don't do today but uh those years that I was there, I was Miss a and M, I was Miss Omega Psi Phi, and I was an honor roll student, and I was just enjoying doing the whole thing. So that was five of those latter years you're talking about. And then after I finished, I went to work in, the first teaching job was in Sylacauga, Alabama, not Huntsville. And uh, that was a, a three-year experience of where I really consider myself having learned to teach 
because the principal there recruited what he considered the best teachers that would that he could find to bring them to his quote unquote school, where uh, he would be a good principal, I suppose. But uh, it was a learning experience for me. But that's still a cargo. But after that three year period, I came back to Huntsville and worked at Council High. And what was, the, what was the main industry in Huntsville? The main industry at that time was based on the cotton economy. Uh, there were a few other persons in businesses, small businesses, you know, shoe shops and beauty shops and places like that. And some of the businesses, I guess, of big companies like GE had businesses. So there were businesses but nothing much going on in the 50s business-wise except a small business and no real, I can't remember any big business of the size of, you know. We lived in neighborhoods and uh, neighborhoods were changing. That You had the beginning in that latter period of low-income housing coming into one different parts of Huntsville being built and population being uh, set into directions of who was going to live where. The old established area, of course, was Eccles Hill and that area. And then this area, Northwest Huntsville, has always been where predominantly blacks have lived. And uh, that is still the focus of direction. How different do you suppose 1950s Huntsville was from, say, 1950s Montgomery or any other town in, in Alabama? I think it was uh, because of its uh, population and because of its le educational level then, there was a greater uh, leadership which formulated uh, a larger and better city, you know, better in the sense of options for work and jobs and other things. I think there was a group constantly involved mentally and psychologically in how they could improve these things, jobs. Uh, and that was a bit, it's been ongoing, it's ongoing now. It has been ongoing since day one that I can remember. And that's a big plus because what you always have, like when the, Von Braun, uh, the NASA came, and those missile agencies, they still had that line drawn, and the average person would not make over 30, 35,000. So the thousands of others that were working, hundreds in engineers and so forth, they were making big salaries comparatively and are today. So that's what I see. Does it? I may be getting a, the wrong impression, but I think what I'm picking up from what you're saying is that civil rights came to Huntsville a little easier than it did, say, in Montgomery or Birmingham. Is that is that? Uh, is yes, that? very much so because of the leadership. I keep saying leadership. The leadership had things they wanted to accomplish particularly when they are seeing the dying and death of a cotton economy, and they ha know they must move on. Leadership knows that before it happens. They begin working toward those ends and trying to see and cooperate and working and do all that they could do to get these changes in place. You know, that was ongoing. If it hadn't been that ongoing determination and motivation, it wouldn't have happened, not in anywhere. But definitely Huntsville led this because I think of the intellectual uh, ingenuity, determination, goals, aspirations of key people in the community. Well, I, it's interesting. It's, it would seem that, that you are an expression of that because, you know, you're, you, an African-American female, is, are writing a master's thesis in the era in which George Wallace is standing in, you know, on the, the yeah, steps. Yeah, it might not have been safe to do that. so, too. Well, and, and, and I just can't imagine, you know, being African American, that's one hit. Mm -hmm. Being a female, that's another hit. Yeah. And, you know, being in, in segregationist Alabama, 
at kind of the sort of the, the height of the struggle, and here you are, not just going to college. You, it sounds like you went to college, and that was really not something that anybody gave much thought about in terms of that being particularly exceptional around here. No. And then and it wasn't exceptional you, with, with my class, that is, the ones who were better students and they had dreams. Now, there were a lot of others that didn't fall in that category. So we can't say that's, that we represent the majority. We were a minority in the sense of goals and aspirations, those who went on to college right. and all of that. But they were your goals and aspirations. Right, it wasn't exactly. That, yeah. you know, I, I, and I could be wrong about this, yeah. but my sense is that in, say, you know, Birmingham, Montgomery, you know, for if you had been in Birmingham, yeah. Montgomery yeah. in those days and yeah. you wanted to go to college, yeah. that might have been a much different proposition yeah. than it, it was would, for you up It here. would have probably been because my mother went to speak with the business manager because the president of the college university was Dr. Drake. And uh, my mother worked for his son here. He was a medical doctor. And I think, I suppose that she, Mrs. Drake, encouraged my mother to talk with the business manager because we had no resources to go. My mother, you know, father didn't play any role in contributing during my childhood. So she did. She asked me to... So she went out there and talked with him and asked if he would give me a job so that I could work. And that maybe was the beginning for me. But being in close proximity with some of the people who are involved in the process, it makes it easier for some of us. And that may have been the stroke that, that was spawned at that time, I don't know. But I know he gave me a job and I worked a whole four years and I was happy about it. <laughs> Well, <laughs> since you mentioned that, and I know you and I have talked about this yeah, a lot on the yeah, phone and yeah, here today, yeah. but now that we've got the camera rolling, yeah. um, do you have any sense that Warner Von Braun had any, was engaged at all in the civil rights issues locally at that time? He couldn't separate himself from it if he wanted to move toward his goals. He, has a, he had a general goal, I'm sure, to get into the moon. And so did the city of Huntsville. So concomitantly, they worked together toward those ends. I think may have been stealthy, surreptitious, but there was a, uh, I would think, personal and uh, pr goals of the city and and Bon Bonavaron to reach those ends. I really feel that. And so that sounds in keeping with what mm -hmm. you were saying previously about, um, you know, sort of the end of one one industry being cotton, you know, the idea that in order to, you know, as a city mm -hmm. move forward and kind of, you know, kind of be ready for the future, that these old ideas of things like segregation and racial superiority, et cetera, yeah. that maybe it was time to get past those things. Then, you know, for in kind of the golden period mm -hmm. of the space age, mm -hmm. Huntsville was home base mm -hmm. to the most technologically mm -hmm. advanced mm -hmm. future, mm -hmm. you know, that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Um, you know, it seems like there's, in, in, in some sense, I don't, I, you know, I certainly couldn't say that one led to the other or had any, you know, but it's an interesting coincidence that, you know, the city who was maybe more forward thinking than other parts of the state also ended up becoming the home of more forward thinking than, you know, lots of the world. Well, it's like magnets. They attract. And I think that was that attraction of capable, intellectuals, goal-oriented people through the missile program you're talking about, and otherwise, too. As today, as I mentioned, there are numerous, you know, persons well-educated in the city of Huntsville. And, you know, when all, all those forces come together, they people who are generally educated, they have goals and purposes, and, and they want to be involved. And I think Huntsman was one of these cities, they even have a bicycle uh, club where they can just ride, you know, where they can, rules and regulations for using the bicycle to ride anywhere in Huntsman they want to go. Of course, the mayor is a, a one of these, but it just shows you little things that bring interest in and organization and strategies to deal with it. So, so backing up a little bit, um, what made you decide to go into teaching? 
Well, I uh, first offer that I had when I was when I graduated, one of the first was to be a typist at Redstone. That was all available at that time. That, with that degree of BS, that was it. And teaching. And I had two teaching jobs offered. And I did not want to sit behind a typewriter. And I had trained to go to school to be a teacher, and that's what I wanted to do. So I don't know when that idea passed. Maybe it started. My grandmother was a teacher in the Madison County School System, Rosetta Brown. Her daughter, my aunt, and my daddy's father, brother, my daddy's sister was an ed uh, educated person. Went to, she got her degree at Vermont. And uh, she uh, taught me at Council High. So, and two, uh, education teaching was one of the few areas that you could be sure of I think having a continued income and moreover the need existed. So you want to prepare as yes, students do today. Where can I get a job? How much is it going to pay? And how long can I depend on it? So those were questions that were answered for me. My grandfather was a mailman. So I came out of a group that didn't see being a fireman as where I wanted to go. <laughs> Very good. Uh, let's see. Um, My father was a mailman, too. So those were first two of the first black mailmen in Huntsville. Of course, the grandfather preceded the father. But uh, it was, uh, once again, part of a structure of people who wanted to do things and had plans to do things and, and were there available to do it. Well, it, it, it's interesting, you know, when you mentioned that, that the, you know, there seems... The role of the federal government uh, seems to be an odd one in Huntsville in terms of, um, you know, certainly in order to continue the, the space programs and the things that were going on here locally, you know, that had to, that had a sort of a practical effect on the politics, you know, that although it sounds like Huntsville was sort of ahead of the curve on the segregation issue, um, still, even if it hadn't been, it also sounds like it would have been necessary for Huntsville to get ahead of the curve on the segregation issue in order to maintain the federal funding that was going into the work that was being done. Oh, it was critical. It was critical. Yeah. And they were wise and thought thoughtful to ensure the continuation of those funds within the coffers of Huntsville. And that's why you had people like uh, Mrs. Richardson that I referred to in my thesis who uh, had a husband who was an attorney. And she said she wanted to be able to have more her husband to do more than file income taxes. And unless they made changes and accepted, uh, be acceptance of changes in the social work, you know, people working together, race not being a factor, she knew she, that her business, her husband's business, wouldn't move forward. And back to Mr. Cummings of the same era, he was saying the same thing. And so get on with it. Let's do what we need to do to get it done. So you had a lot of people, whites in the middle class, I suppose you'd say, who were intent on accepting and forcing change to make it possible for the missile or any other business to come to Huntsville. Do you have any sense of how your students felt about their place in, especially given all that you said, do you think that as compared, and I know you weren't in these other places, but as compared to say a teenager in Birmingham, do you, do you get the sense that teenagers in Huntsville felt like they could achieve a little more in life than maybe the teenagers in Birmingham might have felt? Well, I can't speak for that because I didn't live in Birmingham, and I don't know what the students and young people were thinking, but I have visited Birmingham many times, and my observations are now and in the past, there was less of a cultural base in Birmingham, less, um, less effort to attract a more educated workforce, and therefore, 
it was really not a lot of uh, people trying to help young people to move on. There was nowhere to go except maybe to high school, and then there was no no movement there. They couldn't. I don't think it was no. It was a Miles College there, I think, but it was very selective, I think. But the opportunities weren't as plentiful in Birmingham as they have been in Huntsville for that kind of advancement. I don't think so. Okay. Um, so, and again, I know we've talked some about this, but um, did you follow, what did you know, particularly back during the time of Warner Von Braun and the space program in Huntsville? Were you aware, like, for example, when they first, you know, they first came here and I believe 1955, it might have been 1954. So around the time you were graduating from college is when the German rocket team would have been coming to Huntsville. Mm -hmm. Do you recall any of that? Uh, it's hard to put times on things you recall. And I don't know how early I was aware that the missile team and Von Braun was uh, in Huntsville. But I, being a student who liked to read the paper and talk with people about things going on and my own observations, I would think I did know, but it wasn't a real priority with me <laughs> at and, that time. And can you speak to why it might not have been a priority? Well, uh, once again, if you look at the workforce, and I did do an in-depth review uh, of the Huntsville employment uh, opportunities with the person in charge of hiring. The, he was in charge of, uh, what do you call those, that uh, deal with the workforce. HR, human resources. Yeah, right, human resources. I, and when I, I got, well, I won't go into details, but I, he did give me the basic data that they give you. But uh, there was a concern that I asked for an appointment with him. And uh, I did, he, they sent with him a safe person to ensure that I didn't ask what I shouldn't have asked, one of my group. And that person's still playing that role today, incidentally. But um, the data shows that there were, there was just no, very few blacks were being hired in, within that industry. And those who were, they were very outstanding. And that's one I might I have on my list is to give you to see. And uh, uh, Mr. Charles Ray, who was with, I think he worked with the Marshall Space Flight Center for a number of years. And he was in the civil rights movement activity here too. And his funeral home was up the street. So anyway. Uh, there are those who did have some positions and titles and ent entitlements, but few. There were few in math. I knew one young man had finished school with me in math. He was a very good math student, and he received a job there. So in the earlier stages, there were those few who were selected to work, but they were, there were few and in between, and, and the salary was not that good considering the jobs that they were performing. <coughs> Excuse me. So it didn't entice me to be a part of that regimented system for the little money that they were going to pay, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> yeah, and I enough. just didn't want to be a part of that, sitting behind a typewriter playing those games. I had more independence in the classroom, freedom. And well, uh, more impact. More impact. And speaking of impact, uh, my students, several years, different years, uh, I had them involved in an assignment, a detailed assignment of select one person you're interested in. And I had a whole list of maybe 40, 50 people in the black community. And I don't think I had any in the white community because I was trying to get them to understand what these people had gone through. So I had excellent reports, and I still have some of the tapes from that period that I pulled out the closet the other night. Some of them, the people they went to, people like John Cashin, who was very active in the community. It was through his wife, uh, who's late, his late wife, that I got the copies of the notes from the meetings that they held. And that helped me with the writing of the thesis because she was a good note taker. And so I'm saying that uh, 
it was just a lot going on at that time. And I think it was interesting to see those things happen. Well, so despite, you know, I mean, certainly as somebody who, yeah. who liked to read the newspaper yeah, back yeah, at that, yeah. that time, you know, obviously at some point you became aware that there was a group of Germans who, uh, and, and I, I don't know how clearly stated this ever was back in the time, but who were essentially a group of captured Nazis that we brought yeah, back. Yeah, yeah. Who were coming to, to Huntsville to, well, I guess when initially when they came, they were coming to build weapons. Um, do you recall any reaction in the community, the larger community, whether it be the black community or the entire city, uh, that uh, any kind of reaction about this idea of bringing 120 Nazis to Huntsville? Was there any kind of backlash or concern? No, I never, I never, and I wrote that in my summary of preparation for you today, I never experienced any Nazism or any negativism toward the people because I think the people whom I was around and talked with, generally in my observations, they were that these were people needed to serve a particular goal and let it be, and that was all I knew. You know, we, don't, we didn't deal with that other thing, is that they are pulled here to do a job which is very critical and, uh, and they want not to be an inter interference. And that's pretty much the way the black community responded. Now, I don't know about the other community. Well, it, so, but, but getting a little further down the road, so come, you know, what, 1957, 58, uh, when, when, you know, after Sputnik is launched, do you recall Sputnik mm -hmm, being launched? Sure. What, what, did, what do you think about that? I still don't get excited about the, the people going to Florida to see it, you know, launched. And that was not spugnant, but I mean, in more recent years, you used to read in the paper where people went and they, and they didn't, weren't able to complete the mission, and so they, you know, but the point is, it's never excited me, except that I sense progress being made, and that's good. So, once, once the, the goal became very clear, so, uh, you know, the United States reaction to Sputnik was, we got to accelerate this. We got to put a man on the moon. We got to beat the Russians. Yeah, I remember that, Rush. W what did you think? Did you think that was a bunch of crazy nonsense? <laughs> well, I just felt that we're in a world where you have to compete. I don't exist. And that's the way I looked at it. There's a need to do what they have to do in order to move ahead. Do you think there was any kind of thought in, in, in that sense of, you know, well, why is it on one hand we're, we're, we're being so inhumane to one another, on the other hand we're trying to go so far forward as to putting a man on the moon? Do, do you, are you, were you personally ever sort of considering sort of the, the disconnect between those two things or thinking about things that way at all? I guess I did, but it just wasn't a priority. To, to oppose what the power structure wanted to do. And it was going to bring jobs and more. I don't want the nation that I'm a part of to be la a laggard in the process. So it's a matter of survival, cultural survival. You know, that's the way I looked at it. Well, that's an interesting point. Despite how, you, how inequitably you may have been treated, you were still an American. Yeah. And you still wanted America yeah, to be, sure. you know, yeah. whoever the... <clears throat> right, right, right. How did Werner von Braun and the space program influence desegregation? Well, I think we said that over and over and over, and I don't see any any variation of what I've already said. That he stimulated, motivated, guided, directed the missile program through NASA. And NASA was the main vehicle, though there was the Marshall Space Flight Center, there was NASA, and there were two or three others uh, groups that were dealing with different things at Redstone. But he was the one in, uh, uh, dealing with the uh, Marshall Space Flight Center. He was the one even had programs, training people, the whole process. He was in charge of. So now, 
You were saying, what was again, you asked me what? Well, the, the, the question here on the page is, um, how did Warner Von Brown and the space program influence desegregation? Yeah, well, they couldn't operate, scientists couldn't, in a segregated environment. That's clear, clearly stated throughout my thesis, and I've listed pages for that re reference. And therefore, they had to get the segregated matter settled as soon as possible. And the leaders moved in that direction. They didn't steer away from that. They knew they had to meet it head on. So it was an ongoing effort to get the schools to desegregate to get the universities and colleges where that was no longer a problem, segregation, to make sure that jobs would be available, training programs, the whole preparation for this change was carefully orchestrated. And, and why was that deemed so necessary here? Because it was a transitional period in America, in the state, and in the city. And we were going into places we've never been before. You had to change the population. You had to train the population, those who were going to participate. And it's, it's a transition. And all of these forces had to be synchronized to reach those ends. Well, I'm curious to know, and, and we're on a good track here, speaking in the context of Huntsville, mm -hmm. why is it that Huntsville collectively seem to go in that direction, whereas cities like Montgomery and Birmingham resisted it. Well, you had a readiness of people here, a, a core group of people who were ready for change, who did not want to be caught behind when change can be made. That would benefit the whole process. People, schooling, education, everything could be improved. They saw that. And it just wasn't locally. The, the governor, and now we had different governors at different times. Wallace was doing part of the time, but I can't think of the name of the previous one or two. But the governors moved with it too. So it was a concert, concertized, you're moving in unison of the people in power structure to get things done that were necessary to take advantage of this opportunity. Senator Sparkman was one, one of the key senators from Alabama, and he worked diligently to bring about funding of these programs. And he told them, the business community, what they had to do to get the funding. So it was a hands-on involvement process to make sure that we were ready for that process to make it go forward, like any other activity you want to bring about. You had to plan, prepare. And we did. Do you think that it's as simple as to say that uh, you know the the power structure in place in Huntsville at that time saw desegregation as a a means of income, or do you think it was more sincere than that? Oh, you can't ever separate uh, income out of a factor of change. That probably is the primary motivator. And different people saw it differently, but I don't know there were many people who didn't feel that they could get a job from, from being a janitor to being a scientist, an engineer. So, you know, that excitement runs through a population, no matter what. A job is a job is a job. And I think that was enough motivation for anybody. How, how does that look now, 40, 50 years later? How does what look? How ha, has, has that borne itself out? Has, has the rising tide raised The expectation all been satisfied? Is mm -hmm. that what you're asking me? Yeah, or, or do you feel like just in general, um, you know, can, can say, you know, young African-American teenagers expect more from their community than, say, you could at, when you were a teenager? Yeah, I think that's a reality. But it's still a very small percentage, I think. And that's what's leading in part of the problem with the crime and with the drugs, not only in Huntsville, just everywhere. There has to be some preparation, some, some attention given. We can get to the moon and live on the moon. I, I really, 
I'm curious about why we're in such a rush to get to the moon, frankly. And I'm curious about it because um, the um, efforts are intense to find a place that we can, the population of that's going there will be able to sustain life. In other words, it has to be a place that has similar characteristics as Earth, like water, for one thing, on that continent land that we go to. And it's intense work here being done, and I don't know where else. I've been keeping up with it slightly on ETV. They, oh, yeah, that's your station. I, I had two specials back-to-back -back not long ago. I found them very interesting. And soon after that happened now, I'm seeing articles in a newspaper about people who want to go to the moon and how much, uh, well, the whole preparation, they're going to move quickly toward these ends, I sense. Are you part of that? You're not? Okay. Well, <clears throat> I'm seeing that it, it gives me concern because while we were anxious to get to the moon, and we did so, we now, I sense, since the people who are going to the moon would be the very rich ones because it takes a lot of money to go there. And that means they are interested in abandoning this earth and going to another place because it's probably so polluted and that's why they don't want to deal with pollution. It's so polluted, so contaminated. I had a garden across the street for three or four or five years and I sensed that the air was so polluted it didn't help the plants. And I gave up on it. <laughs> of course, this is a city in the sense you could probably 10 miles from here, five miles away it would be good. You know, it wouldn't be the problem as much as it is, but it's still a problem. Pollution is a problem, and we're doing nothing about it as a people. So I feel that we will have to uh, make some decisions about the earth that we habitate because it's not going to be here for us long. And I think the scientists and those who, you know, it's been coming out a lot about things, junks that we've just junked, we've abandoned on, in the outer space. Well, that's just one incident. Think about all the other scientists in all around the world, from Russia to Germany, wherever else. They are doing the same thing over the last 20, 30 years they've been doing. And they don't care about this earth because they don't really plan to stay here, I don't think. I think they're making provision for the next population to go somewhere else and dump this one. That seems, does that seem strange to you? Well, I, I, I don't know what seems strange to you. <laughs> I know, it's difficult to, to make that assessment. And, and, and so, and that's a little bit about, you know, that's, that's kind of what I was asking you about how you felt, say, back in 1968 when it was hustle, 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 get a man on the moon. You know, I wonder, you know, from, from somebody in, in the, the portion of the community who was not part of all of that, if they thought, you know, go to the moon, yeah. you know, I can't even, you know, you're about to put a road through my house. Right. And you're worried about going to the moon. Right. You know, that right. must have been a really strange circumstance. Yeah. But people tend to understand and not get upset and bothered by it. And they just go along to the next step. And then when it gets to that point, he's there to say, well, I tried to tell you that, but it was no need because I had no power to make any real changes. I was looking through, because you were coming, I went to the house across the street where I had the little garden. And I went through, it was cold too that Saturday. I wanted to dig out the newspapers and the articles that I, I started working on doing my sabbatical, which was some few years after the thesis was written. And I know I had done a lot of research on the next, well, let's say from 60, 65 to 85, well, it was a set period, I think 20, 25 years thereafter, and I was trying to see the same categories, what had happened. And I saw, um, what did I see that set me? found very interesting. I found one of the main topics that's in every Huntsville Times every day, at least the main articles is desegregate, not desegregation, is education, it's the schools. And we've just got a new principal superintendent here. And there's been a lot of concern about getting rid of the old one. They accused her of overspending. 
10 million, um, whatever million, some 10 million, I think, overspending, whatever, with overspending. Well, she was overspending, I think, in order to try to satisfy those who were signed her check, okay? So she didn't see in depth all of these things that as they built more schools, they were getting rid of schools in other communities, just getting rid of them. And we don't have a school in this community. And don't no plans of having one. So uh, people see things happening, and they want to take the school now and sell the, la the land, and it has some acreage to it. They want to sell the land. Well, Second Mile wants to buy it. That's a, a group that you know about Second Mile. Okay. Uh, so the community is concerned about what they're going to do with the acreage that's facing University Drive about 15 or 20 acres, I don't remember. But, um, you know, it's just a matter of misguided objectives. But then they met and they pretty much, some did say, what are you going to do? A thousand questions were asked. What do you plan to do with the school? What are you going to do? And, uh, of course, that those were not the questions to be asked, but they were asked. And I'm just saying there's always that entity or that time and place that you have to raise questions about things, though you know your question is insignificant and won't be addressed with any, with any uh, commitment to do the right thing. So you get tired of that. that oh, what I was saying, I, I saw all these letters I had written to the mayor and to other people. I don't know if I ever mailed it, half of them, but I'm saying that I was troubled about the process then, unfairness of it. And I guess I'll go to my grave troubled by it. <laughs> I'm supposed to be troubled by what's not right and what's illegal and illegitimately conceived, aren't I? <laughs> and I guess that's the way it is. And so <coughs> were you saying that, that that's also sort of That's kind of what your attitude towards the space industry was, too, of like, eh. Well, science is another thing. It's not like, you know, science means that there's progress, exploration, new things are happening. And you don't know all the ramifications of what can be good and what cannot be good. So I looked at that a little different, but I still have concerns about the manipulation of the environment you know, which is short-lived at best. <laughs>